Welcome to the Visual Effects Notes podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by F-Track and Action VFX. F-Track is an Academy Award-winning company specialized in project management, production tracking, and the creation of media review platforms for the creative industry. I've been using F-Track for the last six years and it has helped me with all my visual effects projects. F-Track has recently released two new versions of its media review software. Check out F-Track Review for the new interface and even more accessible reviews. You can also try CineSync 5, the brand new version of CineSync, built from the ground up for the most secure, high-quality review sessions out there. You can try both both products for free via the link on the description below. This episode is also sponsored by Action VFX. Action VFX is the best place to get high quality stock footage. I've used Action VFX in game cinematics, short films, trailers, and commercials. They are the best stock footage I've ever come across. You can also use the promo code Hugo's Desk for 10% off. Please visit actionvfx.com to learn more. And now on to the show. Hi everyone, welcome to the latest episode of VFX Notes. I'm Ian Fales from Befores and Afters, and as always, I'm joined by Hugo Guerra from Hugo's Desk. Hi Hugo, how are you going? I'm very good, I'm very good, Ian. We got debris, Ian! We got debris! <laughs> we got debris, we got cows. That's right. We are today talking about Jan de Bont's Speed 2. I mean, sorry, Twister. Twister. Oh right. my god. What am I saying? <laughs> and you wish it was P2. <laughs> such a good such a good film. <laughs> it almost was Speed 2. Uh, yeah. Wasn't yeah, it yeah. really when you think <laughs> yeah. about it? It is. It is really <laughs> Speed 2. It's just that it's a bit it's a different chase. But no, but yeah. No, I'm doing I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh and yeah, and and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Everything's good. Well, we just always want to start with thanking our watchers, thanking our patrons on Patreon, thanking our sponsors. Um, you've really helped make the VFX Notes podcast a, a real thing. I mean, I think, you know, I didn't think we'd get up to this many episodes, Hugo, but here we are. Here we are I now. <laughs> I know. We're, we're, we're close to 20-something now. And uh, yeah, this is great. I can also see, Ian, that uh, you are looking very nice. Look at that. Like you're all pruned <laughs> up. I like I like the new style. I got a haircut. Yes. You, I got a you, haircut. You, it, it did happen. <laughs> you got, got rid of mm. the of the lockdown look now. <laughs> <laughs> which is good it was out of control <laughs> out of control well anyway i i'm i'm stoked to be talking to you hugo and talking to you about one of my favorite 90s yeah. films from really one of my favorite director slash cinematographers jan de bont and you know twister for me hugo just to go straight into it yep. was just such a you know it's one of those films that I literally remember seeing at the cinema, you know, in my teens. And I don't always remember films that I'd seen at the cinemas. Speed is obviously one of them for people who know me. But Twister was another one. And it's because of the experience. It's because of the visual effects. It's because of the humor and the sound as well. I'm sure we'll talk about the yeah. sound. But just going back, Hugo, what's your memory of possibly seeing Speed you know, I, I, in 96? If you did. I did, I did. I remember it very, very well. Mm. I was 18. <laughs> so, you know, mm. I, I remember going to the cinema. I went to the cinema with uh, with some friends and I was just blown away. I was completely blown away. <laughs> well, no, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> no, I watch, watching it on the cinema is a huge experience because not only it looks beautiful on the big screen, of course, but also the sound. This is one of the first films that has like an amazing DTS like surround system thing going on. And that was really mind blowing. You were on the middle. I remember so clearly going, being on the middle of the cinema and really feeling the wind going around you all in all places. No, but the film. Yeah, the film has a huge mark on me as well. Uh, it's so fun and it's. it has Bill Paxton. I love Bill Paxton. Everyone loves Bill Paxton. He's, he's mm. so funny and he's. Coming from Aliens too, I just like I just love him to death. I'm so sad that he that he passed away, and it was such so sudden. But you know, and then also Ellen, Elena Hunt, and I I just feel like like the film ticks all the boxes for the '90s nostalgia. And I, I'm sure 
I'm sure some of it is nostalgia because the film does, if you look at with today's lenses, the film is a bit, a bit out of control and it's a bit too much. But I still love it to that, and I think <laughs> I think it's because I watched it back then when I was 18. It has a huge mark on me. Mm. It's a bit weirdly light on, <laughs> isn't it? There's heaps of action, but it's an action movie. Find it's... me a plot in Twister, and I'll give you a million dollars. I mean, it's it's literally an action movie of people of weather people. It's just like it's just a bit silly. <laughs> like it's so silly and it's so over the top. And that music doesn't shut up. It's like dun, 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 it just doesn't shut up. Yeah, <laughs> it's so high tempo. <laughs> it's like speed. It's exactly like speed, but it's just weather people. It just it's so funny <laughs> i love it <laughs> but it did it did kind of i'm sure in america in america people already knew about the phenomenon of storm chases but around the world it really kind of um you know brought that to everyone's attention that these people exist yeah. and they go out in these vans and they use the current technology And they try and, well, I think there was a mix of storm chasers who do it for scientific experiments and storm chasers that just do it for fun almost, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, it's fun. It's, yeah, and, it's, it's really funny because a lot of people don't, don't be, like when they watch the film, and even now, like, like, oh, this is so it's exaggeration. And it is, in a way, it's, it's a bit exaggerated because it's not this fast. They don't go out and, and do it on this high tempo. <laughs> they don't live like this, but... But there is a fascinating documentary on the on the on the Blu-ray, which is a, a, a time capsule. It's like a, a documentary from the History Channel, either the History Channel, or the National, or, or National Geographic. I can't remember which one, but it's like one of these TV documentaries about storm chasers, and it's very mm. '90s, you know, talking about how they do it, and it's very accurate. The film, the film is exactly like that documentary, and I. I Because the documentary is also very flashy, you know, the typical History Channel 90s documentary that has like, like negative and then it has like slow motions, then it has like the, the, the flashes of the storm and then they have high tempo cuts. It's a very flashy documentary um, mm. and it, it kind of feels like the film, it almost like feels like the director watched that documentary and thought this could be a good film. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit like that, but <laughs> it's all true. Yeah, it is. And also the technology you see on the film, although a bit enhanced, it is that. That's the technology that still today is kind of used, of course, more modern technology. They at least have sat-nav this time, <laughs> not just maps all over right. the place. But yeah, it's fascinating when you go deeper and you read about it and you watch documentaries from the time. It is quite fascinating how accurate it is. And you, 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 when you, when you read that and you listen to that, you're kind of surprised by it because it's bonkers, isn't it? What these people are doing? It's just nuts. It's nuts. Like going to the oh, middle. I thought you meant what? I thought you meant the film was accurate, as in it lifts yeah, no. tractor trailers and cows. <laughs> But I, I, you mean the storm yeah, chasing no, yeah, part of I mean. it? Yeah, oh, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, the yeah, film yeah. is is the film is accurate. <laughs> Kind of. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> I know what you mean. As accurate as speed is, I guess. <laughs> But let, let's let's. There's one thing I need to say though. Like this this guy, man. We we all love. We, we both love him. Like John Devont. Like he, this this pr single director cinematographer is responsible for our childhood. If you think about it, kind of. <laughs> if you think about yeah. it, kind of because. Yeah. Not only is the director of Speed and Twister, and unfortunately of Lara Craft, Cradle of Life, I don't want to talk about that one, but he's also the DOP of Die Hard, of Black Rain, of Hunt for the Red October, mm. Flatliners, Basic Instant, Little, Wep Little Weapon. Mm. It's insane. Mm. This guy photographed some of the best 90s movies ever made. It's it's oh absolutely it's insanity how how yeah. deep this And guy is on our on our psyche you know on the '90s movies. Yeah, I think, in fact, I know of visual effects artists who use Jan de Bont's cinematography at least in replicating yeah. that look and feel in visual effects yeah. shots. <laughs> like that's how influential I think he is. Not just the actual cinematography but the 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 movement of the camera the the 
I mean, everything about his camera work was exciting, yeah. right? And helped tell the story. And when he went into directing, he he maintained that excitement. Unfortunately, he he really bottomed out, you know, after probably Speed Two. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, he did the um, hunt, the haunting, which is okay. I, I like that film, but it's not as good. You're right. And and then Tomb Raider, the the second Tomb Raider, is just a terrible movie. I'm afraid. But <laughs> he hasn't done much lately, though. Like, I think he's, he must be retired, I guess, isn't it? Because he hasn't really done much uh, lately. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Yeah. He, he was also big in commercials yeah. for a short time. Um, and anyway, I'm, I'm glad to celebrate the stuff in yeah. Twister. Um, and because basically not only was there some great cinematography to witness because you know you're out in these long landscapes and of course you know we've got um lots and lots and lots of car to car shots but yandabans also taking on the latest technology at the time and i think that's an interesting thing that we might talk about hugo which is i'm talking about cg yes but i'm also talking about practical effects yeah. this film twister was one of those great meeting of the minds, wasn't yeah. it, of practical and CG. And um, you've been fishing up some old yeah. comments on in Cinefax and elsewhere just about that kind of thing, which feels very relevant today it, it does. as well in that sort of CG versus practical debate. It does. It's, it's fascinating when you're reading the Cinefax article and you're listening to what, you know, John Fraser is saying on the article and you're listening to the ILM team, Stefan and, and also Abid, what they're kind of talking about, um, you know, about the marriage of practical and visual effects and digital and how digital can can augment what they've done on set and what they've done on set is a reference for what the CG can be. And I'm reading this, this article from July 96 and it's like mm. 27 years now. And I'm reading it and I'm kind of like, man, we were there and now we're not anymore. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like we used to be much more clear on this. The digital and practical doesn't matter which one. Everything is filmmaking. We're trying to use every tool on our disposal to to deliver the best film possible. And now we just waste so much time talking about, oh, this was all shot in camera. Oh, this was all practical. Oh, this is all CG. We hate it. And it's funny how this these these people at the time which are pioneers of this they had such a clear view of this such a transparent and professional view of this of how everything can be merged and it's a fascinating read and i think the 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 um, the quote really is 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 beautiful you know at the, at the end of it uh you know fraser says like um where practical crew in the sorry digital or practical it's all filmmaking that sentence really resonates with me doesn't matter if it's digital doesn't mm. matter if it's practical because this i guess the the funny thing with this is that this film is almost 40 years old this film was the first real time where you had a film where visual effects are done like they are done now you know because before this you know they had to kind of like put track, like they kind of have to be careful with camera moves. They kind of had to put the camera on sticks. They kind of had to really think about yeah. green screens and blue screens all up to the 80s and the early 90s. That's how things were done. And then this film just throws all of that out the window. This film is exactly made as we do films now, you know, like handheld, there, you have like cameramen on trucks and they're with bouncing with the trucks and, <laughs> and no one knows where the movement is and they have to track it all by hand. They have to rotoscope. There's no blue screen on the film. It's all done for real on the camera and then completely augmented by digital CG on top. It's, it's literally like, like the Bible for how we do visual effects these days. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's why it's resonating so much with me because I'm not saying it's the first. I'm sure it's not the first. But I think, I guess you would agree with me that it's almost one of the first ones, like high budget films to do this, you know. Oh, I, I honestly think it is. And, and, and some of the people you've mentioned, I might just explain who yeah. they were. John Frazier was the special effects yeah. supervisor. 
Stefan Fangmeier was the visual effects supervisor from Industrial Light yeah. and Magic. Now, ILM, we're going to talk about their particle work and motion, match moving and tracking and weather effects. But what enabled Twister to happen was that lineage, you know, that ILM had established from doing CGI. And we're talking Abyss, Terminator 2, Jurassic yeah. Park. Jumanji came just before this. Yeah. But I think you're right, Hugo. Many of the camera moves in those films and some of the other digital ones that um, ILM was working on were much more about motion control yeah. or not too much yeah. movement. Um, and, you know, here they had to go wild because that was Jan de Bont's style. Yeah. And how silly would it look a big <laughs> wind and twister and locked, tornado yeah. <laughs> happening if it was all locked yeah. off so so it just was the requirement yeah. it doesn't forget about the visual effects yeah. it just was the requirement that that and, had to and also like not only the shaky camera but the multiple cameras like there's at some moments mm. there's nine cameras filming this thing and you know I've been on set many times. When you have nine cameras, you just wish for the best because, you know, normally you want to, like, take measurements of all the cameras and you want to take lenses and they do HDRs and do all those kind of things for references for all for your main camera and then a clean plate and this and that. If you have nine cameras, pff, fuck it. <laughs> you, don't, you just shoot it and then you think for the best because it's all ultimately a documentary style we, we've seen this a few years later with uh, Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott did quite the same number on Gladiator, where he had like three, four, five cameras at the same time shooting, uh, especially on the on the fight sequences in the Colosseum. And so this is this obviously now it's nothing new. Everyone kind of works this way if they're doing a big action piece. But not only this is the style of the director, but also it fits in so well to the story because... At this stage, like you've mentioned in the beginning, people were so used to watching documentaries on TV, on National Geographic, on History Channel, about uh, about storm chasers, and they all are filmed with handy cams, you know, with with video weight A8 right. cameras of people crews with handheld cameras just running around for their lives, mm. and mm. so that shakiness was already embedded on your on your conscience. It, I, I don't think they could give get away with this because everyone has already watched video footage of tornadoes for real with the shaky camera. They had to bring that into the film. You know, there was no other way. Yeah. And here, of course, was an opportunity to show Twister's tornadoes in high fidelity, yeah. which is something they hadn't seen on, no. on, on NTSC TVs <laughs> in shaky cam, right? No. So no yeah. one actually had a film uh, tornado, which is funny. No one actually had. I mean, there was footage of a tornado mm. from the 40s and the 50s, but that was like on 16 very old millimeter lens, like like a film. But no one had like a 35 mil tornado filmed. You know, no one had that. So mm. this is the first mm. time they had. Now they do. It's on the film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also love this film because it represents part of. Um, the bigger picture of 1990s films that that involved VFX as part of the green light process, yeah. right? This film only works with visual effects. Um, it couldn't be done practically. It couldn't really be done with optical stuff. And there was this time in the 90s where ILM in particular, but other studios as well, was asked to do tests yeah. to make sure that you know, it could work and therefore they would green light the film and continue. These proof of concepts are really cool, actually. And one of the coolest things about this, Hugo, I know you know where I'm leading, <laughs> is that the test ILM did made it into the teaser trailer. Yeah. But let, shall we talk about that test first, which is actually really cool? Let's do Let's do that. Like that. Yeah, that's right. You're, you're right. This is not common at all. Like usually tests are not used. And the test looked so, so freaking good that it's on the trailer. And it's funny how people got quite a little upset at the time because it's not on the film. <laughs> that shot is actually yeah. not on the film. And, it, and right. it's such a spectacular shot. But I guess if it was on the film, someone would have had to die <laughs> because they get hit by a, by, a, <laughs> by, a, by a truck wheel. 
No, but this this was really fascinating because as story goes, there's many places where you can read this, but as story goes, apparently, you know, Steve, Steven Spielberg was involved in this process asking for them to do a test for Twister. And they did a test for like, wasn't it like they, they took 10 weeks to do this, uh, basically. And yeah. the, the result, I'm going to play it while we're talking now uh, because we have a looped uh, breakdown of that test, but... It's a beautiful, really, really beautiful test. Someone is just driving inside a truck. It's a plain sunny day, really. You don't really see much going on outside. And then you see some people running, which are the production people of ILM. <laughs> They're just like running everywhere. And then they do a bit of a turn on the on the on the truck. And this shot looks very harmless. Doesn't look much. But then what mm. ILM did was they replaced the sky, made a much darker sky. They put a, a gigantic tornado on the middle of everything. And then they have this like huge tractor flying against the camera, destroying everything. It's just fascinating how this shot, one shot, made the studio say, yeah, we're going to do the film. And I I don't think I've heard... I don't think this happens anymore, does it? Like, if you think about it, this is just fascinating. Oh, no. And, you know, it 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 gave extra gravitas to what an action movie could be because... There's the tire that comes in and they're like, oh, well, we could have other things <laughs> flying around and we could, you know, we could create danger through CG stuff. And uh, I mean, yes, they'd seen digital dinosaurs and they'd seen, you know, other digital creatures and they'd seen cars smashing yeah. and, and whatnot in some other ILM projects. But I, I think weather effects hadn't really been tackled before no. in a big way in any film. Not at all. And so... The test, you know, showed action. It showed weather. It showed how you could alter a a very clean plate, effectively. Yeah. Which um, is, you see, that's the fascinating part. This is what we do now. You know, we film whatever we can film, mm, and then we alter mm. it completely. This was not the case at the time. This this was really a turning point no. for visual effects because at this time. This group of people, these pioneers, like this, these amazing artists, I'm, I'm going to have to name them. Like, of course, this was practically, it was led by Abib, uh, which was called, at ILM, he was called the particle guy, <laughs> which was a bit funny. Right, Habib Zagabal. Exactly. Yeah, amazing it was guy. It was led yeah. by him on terms of how this thing, entire thing was going to look. But we also have, like, Stuart Lee modeling. We had the painter was Carol uh, Hayden and Scott Franklin. And then the animator was uh, Dan Taylor. And they were, at the time, using Wavefront's Dynamation. That was the software they were using at the time, which was already quite used on the mask and used on Star Trek Generation. So they were already kind of getting to, to grasps with this software to try to do something like this, a particle system that would use... Uh, you know, smear transparent shaders so that they could kind of do the dusty particles and everything. But I think this single shot really opened up the floodgates for visual effects that we know today because this is the moment, I think, where directors and, and, and filmmakers kind of saw that we could literally, at this stage, change an image that dramatically. Because before this, you would always have, like, you know, the typical composite that was done on practice almost like still on the computer but was still being made like if it was a practical composite where they had masking and they had the camera very static everything was very very uh position where we had on the right side you had the matte painting on the left side you had the footage and very rarely they would cross over there wasn't nothing like that it was like you could kind of see the separation between visual effects this is like they're comping the whole thing behind the windshield. And that, I think, is yeah. the revolution here because they had to yeah. roto and key and then put the windshield back on top of the footage to have that look that is actually being seen by a piece of glass. And mm. that's, I think, the, the revolution on this shot. And I, I, I mm. don't... That's why they green lid, of course. I mean, that shot alone proves that it's possible, you know. Yeah. And that's why they put it on the trailer. And can we just talk about that trailer for a minute? I might be misremembering because I can't remember when I first started accessing the internet. But it was clearly around in 1996. I feel like I remember seeing that teaser trailer as like a postage stamp size thing. You know, real player. 
or some other terrible, you know, video player. <laughs> and that trailer showed nothing. I know. Like the teeth, except for this thing at the end. And it has such an awesome beginning. It's got that voiceover guy saying, there is a mystery, <laughs> elusive, unpredictable, violent. And then, you know, not much happens um, until this thing throws the tire at you. And I just thought, you know, this was this was an era where those kind of trailers really helped sell the film a year early, yeah. often. Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly when the trailer came out. But anyway, that is another thing that I remember about the aura of Twister yeah. Hugo that I just love. And, and what I also love about it is the role of visual effects mm-hmm. in that, yeah. you know, in the marketing of this film. Yeah, exa- exactly. So. That, that trailer, I remember watching that trailer on other movies at the time. You know, before other movies, um, I remember that. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I, I remember, it's on the Blu-ray as well, so you can watch it again to your lovely delight. But it's such a great trailer. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, it's very typical of the 90s. They're like, well, actually, it's very typical of the 90s from a point of view of the voiceover and everything and the, 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 that kind of tension that they create. But it's, it's very different from the typical trailers up to that point where they would show too much. A lot of films, sure. they show too much. Like I remember watching 90s trailers where they show the ending and the plot and the entire thing in three minutes for, on the cinema. So this this was not that case at all. But I, 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 I love what you just said about the fascinating role that visual effects had on the, on the actual green lighting of this film and actually making this film possible. Because this is really why I wanted to talk to you about this film. Because this film comes in a time where it was highly optimism running on the studios and the visual effects community and also on filmmaking, where visual effects was there as a really fantastic tool to augment anything they would shoot and to create worlds that could not be imagined. In this case, we would never be able to shoot this for real. Let's do it with visual effects because there's no other way we can do Mm -hmm. this. And that fascinating moment on the 90s where this director with... James Cameron, with all these directors, Steven Spielberg, all these people, George Lucas, they were all kind of taking advantage of these tools to make wonderful filmmaking, and they were not shy about it. That's what I love. Like, they they were not embarrassed of using visual effects. They were, as as some filmmakers, not saying all of them, as some filmmakers in some studios are now embarrassed, which I, I find it really backwards, that we're now going backwards on this, and there is an embarrassment if something is full CG. There is an embarrassment if they don't use wires or if they don't try to do it practically, even when sometimes it's not even done practically and they're just faking that it was done practically. Mm-hmm. It's, it's fascinating how we went from there, which looked very optimism, uh, like a huge layer of optimism to the industry, and now we arrive to the point where we see, you know, People saying that Fast and Furious was the, all done in camera, or people saying Dune was all done in camera. Th- those kind of silly, stupid things that you read on Twitter, which which is I I, I don't know, man. I I, I what happened? <laughs> what happened in all of the middle of this? You know. <laughs> well, I mean, how long have we I know, got? I know, going? I, know. Um, <laughs> I, I, I I didn't want to pull did the right. conversation to that side. I just I just <laughs> felt that this, this film is a turning point for me. Like, I was 18, man. I watched mm-hmm. this film and I was like, shit, I want to do visual effects. Let's do this. And then The Matrix comes out sure. and Jurassic Park was coming out, like came out a few years before. I got well, pumped and, and now I'm just getting so fed up of, of this thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose, I suppose in a way, um, we're talking about the incredible work that ILM did and we will talk about how amazing the practical effects yeah. were but there was a point in 93 94 95 where this new digital visual effects technology was used for much more storytelling yeah. type yeah. films forrest gump true yeah. lies um twister would you believe i'm saying is more of a storytelling <laughs> type way <laughs> <laughs> but I mean that because it's not really creatures, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, um, and it is more environmental kind of stuff. And, and I suppose, Hugo, in terms of the what happened, 
people will say that between then and now, we just relied on CGI. Yeah. I'm using inverted commas because really when people say CGI, they also mean, or they don't even know they mean, digital compositing yeah. and digital yeah, methods. Yeah. When we relied on CGI, when maybe we should have gone out and shot something. Yeah, I know. By the same token, they'll think that a shot that was shot for real looks better than CGI when they won't, and they won't realize that a CGI shot is actually not a CGI shot, but a real shot. So basically, there's a lot of misinformation and misconstruing of the real situation with visual effects. Um, That's not a very eloquent summary of the 30 years since no, Twister, I but I think that is what's but, going but on I, now. I guess, I guess it's up to us as well. Like I, We have this discussion on Twitter and we have this discussion on social media all the time between some supervisors on, on, on Twitter. And I I feel like, and especially you know, some of them are really advocate of this, like Ceretti and like Vizari, they always are tweeting about this and showing people how mm. things are done. And I, I really, really hope that they keep going and I hope more people join the fray to try to do this because I think we need to be better at explaining visual effects. And that that's one of the reasons I really said yes right away to you when we decided to do this podcast because I feel, I know most of our audience are visual effects artists, but I'm hoping that some of the audience is not visual effects artists. And I'm hoping that some of that audience might discover and, and learn new things that they didn't have thought about it. And I think it starts small, but it grows like that. And then maybe in a couple of years, maybe it has changed. I feel like we all need to be better at explaining and especially at pointing fingers when things are incorrectly like said said in in regular social media or even or even in publications where, you know, just like the recent debacle about the fact that on The Witcher uh, season three, that prosthetic face was all done in camera, was all real. And then sure. the bloody breakdown comes out and it's all in CG practically mixed with the real. So it was both things. But do you really think the publications went in and, and tweaked their articles? No, the, the publications at the time wrote that it was all real and the articles still exist like that and they were they will they will never be changed and the harm is already made because everyone now thinks oh it's so much better because it's real it's a real prosthetic and that's why it looks so good when in fact half of it is cg i feel like we need to be better at this and and we were better at this like at this time at this film going back to twister of course we had that moment where you see it on the behind the scenes on the blu-ray and on the dvds People were openly talking about the visual effects. They were all fine talking about it. Everyone, mm-hmm. no one hid anything. No one said any bullshits. No one were hiding the breakdowns. In fact, they were showing everything. We used to show so much more than now. And I guess they're trying to do mystique. They're trying to hide the magic. But it doesn't work because it just leads to misunderstanding. <laughs> it just leads to misunderstanding. <laughs> and it leads to really really heated debates for nothing heated debates that shouldn't even exist you know yeah i we might have talked about this on the podcast before it it is those things but there's some extra layers there of film marketing because of the bad name cgi has sort of brought to some films um so they try and avoid any kind of you know um characterization of of the film being too cgi (laughs) um but, you know, that phrase, I like literally saw that the other day from a, a film geek person um, describing a trailer he'd seen. And I just saw it. But you haven't even watched the show <laughs> and it's a trailer and you everyone's going to remember. And because so many people follow yeah. you, you know, they're going to agree yeah. with you. Um, oh, by the way, people are totally allowed to have an of opinion course. about whether something looks of good course, or bad. Of course. It's just it's just. It's just the actual terminology. Yeah, I'm talking about the factual thing behind it. Not really. Of course, yeah. people can say that it, they, don't, they don't like it or they like it. But if they're gonna, yeah. if they're gonna report incorrectly things, then it's a problem for me at least. It's a, it's a problem, and I, I, yeah. I feel like that's why we need to be better at this, at, at flagging these things yeah. as much as we can. Although we don't have enough following to really make a difference, but I think all of us together can make a difference if we're all together doing mm. that, because we all can join together. You know, so. Yeah.